Well, welcome everyone. It's so lovely to see all of you here today. It's a thrill. Dairy farms are so much a part of my life as an artist and, and as a supporter of, of local products. And um, it's just wonderful to have other people with the same interests. And, and of course, there are some people that are actually involved in producing products, which is fantastic. Um, and I want to, um, first of all, I want to, to thank the museum, the Cedarburg Art Museum, and Samantha Mikowski, who was at the helm there, there the Zoom, Zoom Center, <laughs> who was the curator at the Cedarburg Art Museum for her support and the support of the museum in general. And of course, to thank the library for providing this venue. That's really wonderful. And uh, my name is Judy Freebert, and as I suggested, I'm an artist, and right now I have an art exhibit at the Cedarburg Art Museum of my dairy farm drawings. And I have been doing dairy farm drawings for a number of years. It's, it's been my main, main uh, subject, and so they're very important to me as an artist as well as for other reasons. And after this uh, panel discussion is over with, we welcome you all to come over to the museum to view the exhibit and to also partake in some chocolate milk, which Peggy um, <laughs> here has so kindly from provided you um, from, from her from, from her um, her farm that the farm that her um, no but her farm tributes at. So that's wonderful. And also to greeting to all the people who are now. We're watching Zoom coming in. Um, welcome to those people as well. Um, and now, well, most of us are aware that we've lost a tremendous number of farms, dairy farms, family farms in our, our state. And it's just very unfortunate for a variety of reasons. And I think that all of, of us here are both aware of And one of the biggest threats two dairy farmers as they lack control of their market. And I decided to form this panel to, to address not only that problem, but also other challenges confronting our dairy farmers. And also to open up discussion on their future. And I'm very encouraged, especially by young dairy farmers, some of whom are here on the panel today, who are, who are now either starting farms or, or continuing the farms of their, of their family, it's wonderful. It gives, definitely gives me hope. And I hope, gives me hope also that there are a variety of dairy farms that can flourish in, in the state. So first of all, I, I want to, um, to mention that um, we're thrilled that these, these farmers are here today to um, discuss the issues. And I consider them to be experts. These are the experts. The people, and also we have a representative from Organic Valley who is here, the cooperative as well. So I want to thank them so much. So we are here to learn, to perform, to learn from the experts. And we, you will have an opportunity to ask questions after I ask a few preliminary questions of the farmers and of the of the Elizabeth McMahon. And then I'm very delighted whatever comes to your mind to ask, ask the farmers, that's wonderful. Um, so I'm going to introduce the farmers. First of all, um, we have um, Peggy Sessler here, who has a farm in Mequon, she and her husband, and your son as well, right? All right, she's not, um, then we have, then we have Shelly Rosenick. Shall I pronounce her Rosenick? Yes, from the Crimson Ridge Dairy in Watertown. Then we have Elizabeth McMullen, who's the PR staffer, Valley Board mentioned. And then we have Bob Roden from Roden Echo Valley in West Bend. And then there's uh, Jeffrey Dom, who's here in the place of his cousin. So we thank we thank Jeffrey so much for coming and um, and uh, taking his place when his cousin had an injury on the farm. So I uh, so we hope. I hope he has a quick recovery. And then Thelma Heidel Baker from Bossy Cow Farm in Random Lake. And the end there. Um, so first I'm going to ask um, 
the finalists a series of general questions. And the questions would be, and we can take one by one, um, why are you in the business of beer? And please inform us and explain how you became a beer and how long you've been in the business. If your method of farming has changed, how many cats you have and what your milk is used for and how and where your mark, mark milk is sold, where your market is. And please state your town to the solution and if you're able to make ends meet. <laughs> Tell us your story. I know that's a lot of questions to ask, so if <laughs> you miss any of them along the line, we'll remind you or we'll just uh, we'll carry on as best as we can. So Peggy, we'll have Peggy start. Um, my name is Peggy Shussel. Um, my husband and I uh, formed uh, LLC with uh, our youngest son. He's one of four children. Um, I was born and raised on a farm. Uh, Ozaki County is has been my home uh, since I was born. Um, but then I moved south to Mequon, of all places, um, <laughs> and met my husband. And, and we um, run the family farm, which was created in 1839. Um, my husband's family came over from Prussia, um, Pomerania, uh, just to uh, get away from religious per persecution and formed a small little community called Freistadt. Um, but we're a part of uh, Mequon, the city of Mequon. Um, we are probably one of only three farms left um, in the city of Mequon. So um, it is hard and it does have its challenges. Um, my son is the seventh generation of our family that has been farmed. Um, so let's see here, um, 85 cows um, is what we built and I wanna say we truly are still a small family operation. Um, his, my husband's grandpa actually um, changed the herd and went all registered Holsteins um, back in, I wanna say like the 1920s. So all of our herd, um, is registered um, and part of the Holstein Association in Wisconsin. Um, so they show at the local fairs, kind of our entertainment, if you will. Um, the kids, the, the kids, the grandkids, um, even my husband and I, and that's kind of how we met was through 4-H program and show at the local county fair. Um, and my husband's side showed at the state. So, and most of our milk goes to uh, fluid. Uh, you hear a lot of farms that ship to cheese factory or their milk gets turned into cheese. Um, our stays whole. Um, and we belong to a co op called Family Turks. Is that the way that's a camp so I think that's separate. I think it's separate. Okay, very much so. Yes, actually, uh, DFA Dairy Farmers of America, who I happen to belong to, a large co op, I think that's good or bad. They actually control about a third of the milk in the country. Mm -hmm. And they bought Cedarburg Kemp's, right. used to be Cedar Kemp's. They bought that out probably five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's owned by a large co op. Okay, thank you for that information. My son and his wife, they have two little boys, <clears throat> uh, six months old and uh, almost three. So hopefully it would be nice if the eighth generation would be able to uh, carry on the legacy of farm. So I think that's it. That would be wonderful. Thank you for your comments. I love what both Shelly and I came all the way from Watertown. <laughs> I'm Shelly Grossnick, um, Crimson Ridge Dairy, a farm inside Watertown, a uh, little town on the Perfect North called Lovett. And my husband and I are the fourth generation on our farm. Uh, and I actually grew up on a dairy farm just down the road from where we farm now. I went to school at UW Madison, a few degrees from Madison, was, did some study tours in Mexico, and uh, it's been a Things, but international business, and, and I'm going back home and marrying the boy next door. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
We have three children, ages nine, eight, and two. And they are probably the reason that we are so farming and still milking cows. Um, given given a lot of things that have happened throughout the last five years uh, for us personally and the, the, the dairy industry in general, how volatile the markets are. It's, it's been a challenging once in a while. Uh, we have, we milk about 200 cows right now. And we have made some changes over the last few years. Um, some of them now by our choice. We had a barn fire in 2013, for example, that really made us look at things a lot differently, um, especially when it comes to the cost of what registered, I don't want to put it registered, valuable, or anything. So, lost them in the fire, didn't get compensation, things like that. So, we actually went away from registered. Um, and we, we went to see a lot of this, uh, costs and expenses. Um, I also have. Uh, one of the major things that we do now, I go to the farmers markets in our area when I come and make mills and sell products that I make um, on our farm under Princeton Kitchen and And I sell jams, jellies, salsa, pickles. Uh, and then I also use our dairy milk and turn it into raw milk soap and milk lotion. And I sell those back to businesses in farmers markets. And recently, I just partnered uh, last year, actually, partnered with a local hemp grower. And we combined our products and created a raw milk CBD soap and a raw milk CBD lotion. Uh, so a lot of that I got into. I have an autoimmune disease that got really sick after having our second, uh, our second child. And that really changed the outlook, not only for our own health and what I do, that kind of set up the set up my pathway for making more of my own products. I have a half acre garden to sell produce and got into making skincare products and things like that because of personally what I do myself because of uh, what I deal with my, with my health. Um, that also helped, kind of also made us look at how we take care of our animals a little bit different. We changed a lot of our vaccine regimens and how we treat them um, if they get sick simply because of what we learned as we go out went through some health, some health things. Really, really kind of interesting. I could talk. I could talk all day. I really could talk all day about that. Uh, but that's what's kind of set up a lot of the things that we're doing now. And uh, we chose, or I chose. I found my passion is food. Whether I'm growing it, um, raising it, making it, selling it, it is food. And milk obviously is included in that. And we we actually belong to Dairy Farmers of America (DFA). That Bob had mentioned, and most of our milk is also stays in the fluid market, um, and it'll go to camps. Sometimes it goes to the Cedarburg plant um, and other places like that. So, yeah, that's stuff. And does that go into fluid milk or to cheese or the the pan milk? Mostly, so fluid is our pan milk goes basically every once in a while. Um, uh, DFA does. Handle a lot of milk still. There are some days that maybe our milk has gone into the craft plant by Beaver Dam and gets made into cream cheese or things like that. Uh, but mostly stays with you know, the Kemp's brand and stays in fluid milk. So. Okay. Well, Marshall, I don't know if that's what you're saying goes into cheese, but not always. Actually, 90% of the milk produced in Wisconsin is used for cheese production. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. right. So it's interesting to hear where the milk is going into cooler milk. Thank you so much for, for that, for your answer. Very interesting. And, and, and I'm so glad that you've been able to recover from the fire. Well, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. You're here today. That's and right. Absolutely. Today, that's very positive. Yes. And Elizabeth, would you like to tell us about your company and your interest and in how you got involved in, in, in the dairy industry? Absolutely. So it's through the form of talking points because I am the ER um, person at Organic Valley. So I am the person that uh, talks to the media and then gives like Thelma talking points so she can tell her story if she needs any um, help or let's say Jerry start reach out to them and like I need talking points. 
So that's what I do. I've been with the co-op for a little over four years now. My anniversary just happened. Um, it was my dream job. I went away for college for a minute and um, also basically met a guy at a wedding and he's like, move home. I'm like, okay, I guess. <laughs> but I need to work at Organic Valley then because I didn't think I was going to end up in Wisconsin, but here I am. So I actually grew up on a dairy farm, so that's why I said I need to work at Organic Valley. Um, it was about a 40, 40 head herd. Uh, my grandfather was a dairy farmer outside of La Crosse, Wisconsin. I loved living on the dairy farm. Um, it, it still is in the family. It is now just a hobby farm, but um, it, it was an amazing experience. So that's why I'm at Organic Valley. I feel like helping my grandfather every day, even though he did pass away in 20, um, 2014. And I, uh, he was part of AMPI. I pulled that out yesterday for my mother. Um, and my grandfather let me pick all the cows that we had in the herd. Um, so it was mostly um, pretty cows like Jerseys and Swiss and some Holstein. That was my four year old mind. And then I got to name all of them. So he had to call Daisy, you know, Daisy Garden, beautiful face. So it was really great. Um, and yeah, I love Organic Valley. It's the best place to work for. And I say that genuinely. And um, my farmers are the best people ever. So um, I, I am taking notes before I get to have everybody on the team. So I will stop there because I can talk all day. Okay. Well, we'll hear from you again if you need to. Yes, and Bob, would you like to describe so, your farm? And I'm Bob Roden. I think you picked a good panel here from what I see so far. Quite a range of size of farms. Yes. I actually started milking on my own. I'm, I'm the second oldest of 10. I have five sisters and four brothers. And my dad said I can't start any more farming. And I do believe the, the message was he's going to try to teach us all equally. So actually, uh, December 19th of 1981, I started milking 24 cows on a 40 acre farm. And we gradually grew over the years. Um, we currently, we had test day the other day. My son's involved with us. So when people ask me how many cows I milk, I don't milk any. <laughs> <laughs> but we have 948 cows on test right now. We just moved this past March 8th into a brand new 40 store rotary stall parlor. Um, there's nothing wrong with small farms being small farms. It's a different gamut when you're gonna start growing and get larger. One of the things we noticed as we started growing, and it's not easy, but you have to start depending on help. And help is real hard to get today, trust me. But by us being forced to hire help, gave us more time off. Could take off if you had people hired here in the States. I believe that there's going to be places for all sides of the farms, all sides of the dairy farms. But sad to say, I believe the trend is just going to be larger farms. Same as the Walmart concept. And the facility we built, we're hoping for the future, planning for the future. We have some robotics currently on it, and they're hoping to develop more. We were, for years, having, uh, growing from the 24 cows to the 75 to the couple hundred, typically always had two or three people that helped do chores for milking, let's, let's say basically milking. We're currently milking, there's no 948 cows, but there's about 850 cows going through the rotary. We're doing all that with three people. And we're hoping in the future to eliminate another one of those person, people. And is that the direction to go? That's the direction I wanted to go. That's the direction my son wanted to go. Um, as far as family, I had five kids and they're all boys except four. So everybody said, you know, <laughs> a lot of help. But that has grown to 17 grandchildren and one on the way. And the boys are finally taking over. There's nine of those. They're all small. 
my sake, they're going to grow faster. But we're hoping to continue this in the future. And this facility would be capable of doing 15 to 1600 three times a day. Um, I don't know if you people realize as many large farms as there are in Wisconsin. I'm calling myself a medium sized farm. There are several farms when we started touring looking for different facilities, several farms that grew for thousand pounds. And it's sad to say that I'm afraid the direction the industry is going. But I don't like seeing is your hog, beef, poultry, Lottie's production egg. A lot of this stuff, the capital is coming from the end processing. A lot of these farms, all they're doing is caring for the animals or doing the cropping. Dairy still has several dairymen. That number is shrinking. And there's word out there now that some of the processes are beginning to get involved with the capital for some of these large farms. And I don't like seeing that. The guy told me a long, long, long time ago, if you want to control people, control the food supply with the fewer and fewer people involved with this production, that's a way that they could maybe control our food supply in the future. A stat with Ozaki County, I, I happen to live in Watch County, I'm Ozaki Watch County line, but a stat that I use when I get involved with discussion like this, in 1978, it was a real good friend with our county agent. There were 300 dairy permits issued in Ozaki County in 1978. Today, I believe there's 27 or 28 in Ozaki County. Cow numbers haven't changed. So I'm hoping we we built this, trying to build a land base. We're hoping that I'm this is a farm I purchased in 1995. You could say I'm a third generation, fourth, possibly the fifth generation. Um, my son's son would take over something. Got a little time to think about it. I think it's about six or seven months old. <laughs> <laughs> The thing that people maybe don't realize, you talk family farms, you got to understand too that 98% of the farms in the United States are still, are still family owned and family controlled. They're corporations, LLCs, whatever, they're family owned. So that, that hasn't changed it much, but they've just gotten larger. It takes a lot of capital, it takes a lot of money to operate. Uh, if you talk the fluctuation just this year, and how do you budget for stuff like that? Just this year, the span of three or four months, our milk price fluctuated five dollars per hundred weight. That's how we get paid. Fluctuated five dollars per hundred weight. How do you adjust for something like that? This year has been favorable. Production A. From we built a brand new freestyle barn and we started milking or moving cows in 15, 15 through twenty. We were really struggling, big time. It was not. It was wasn't fun. And I could tell you stories that I maybe can share with you. Um, instances that we personally went through between fire and fatality and being dropped from insurance that'll raise anybody's life. Somebody asked me the other day, never put a microphone in front of Bob, so. Very, very um, fascinating. Yeah. And I just to interject a little bit here with okay. uh, uh, absolutely you work off the farm. Uh, you have a side business. We're trying to keep family going, our farm going. My daughter is branching off things on our farm also. If you ever look on the computer website, Roden Barnyard Adventure, where she gives tours of our place. Uh, we also offer, she does now, you know, slate rights during the winter months now, we actually picked up a, a business. And in our new facility, we actually built a viewing area that something like this could be held there. And you could you could actually see us milking. We milk at, uh, it takes about four hours to milk now. We milk at seven, two, and 10 at night. So. Well, you're all invited. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and we're just down the road here about six or seven miles. Thank you for you. All right, uh, Jeffrey, would you like to describe your farm? And, and 
or a small farm, uh, for two hours. I do all the work, we move this house whenever we can. Uh, my dad passed away 14 years ago. Then we had a, a part time guy, a full time job, but he loved milking cows. So he worked nights and weekends, and we needed off. He would schedule, he would go to second shift so he could help milk in the morning, actually. And we had another young kid helping until he was 22, and then he moved on. But then we were moving 120 cows back then, and we had help. And my kids, the best part is my kids came to the farm for daycare all the time, so I got to see them all the time. But Lucas never had daycare. My first school we had you know, some daycare. But then uh, George he got old and he didn't want to help us anymore. And the kids started graduating from school and they went to college. And keep going, I didn't want to try looking for help. So start something like cows. So that's where I am right now. And Possibly two, three, four years, I might not have felt it anymore because I'm getting wore out. And my uh, cousins raise heifers about 30 miles north, and I go work for them. And another thing in our area is you guys offering like $200 an acre for land, right? Which is a lot because we're close to the lake and you don't get on your fields early. Your yields aren't as good, typically, over the average. And for me to be a small farmer milking cows, you can't pay two hundred dollars an acre for rent. So actually, I've been buying like half of my feed for the last five years already. That one year pretty much made a decision. I had fifty acres where I didn't get anything off of, but I still had to pay the rent because we don't have property. So, <clears throat> so that's what all I have to say. I guess. Well, well, and and uh, where is it? I know, but you want to tell the audience where you're milking. Our closed up Cedar Valley for 25 years. It's made in the mozzarella provolone, and like two percent of it is made it to the best cream cheese in the world. So. <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> Actually, my goal is when I retire, I have a lot of good friends in Arizona. I tell them I'm gonna sell cream cheese in a parking lot, <laughs> <It's a> grocery <laughs> store, <laughs> because on there they don't know what cheese is. Yeah. And you're going to have a few cows and then have. No, I'll just have a check or something. <laughs> As you sit on the Yeah, for the morning, it'll be all done in two hours. Well, I just want to mention that I um, drive at uh, Jeffrey's farm, and I um, want to say how much I appreciate the generosity he has shown us. I'm sorry, total stranger showing up on his land. Even the cows, she goes right over the past and sits her over. And um, this farm is, is absolutely beautiful. Really is beautiful. It's got a bean going through with the, the farm. Um, it's, it's absolutely lovely. And, so it's been life changing for me because I. Here from, from out east, I was born here in Wisconsin. Without east for many years, and when I came back up to our I was looking for a dairy farm. And dairy farm was abroad. And uh, it's a long story, so I won't go on about it. I ended up at, I was just driving around, went got off the road at Belgium, and I said, Oh, I'll try this. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it's just been a, a pleasure. And also to, uh, to, not only Jeffrey and his, but Lucas, his son, is this wonderful young man. And it's been great to be there with the both of them. So um, thank you for your time. So, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd add one thing and I remember. Okay. Like January of my senior year, then my, I applied, I was going to go to school for engineering. And my dad goes, well, who's going to help me on the farm? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But we are trying um, or sort of uh, participating in this, trying to get your land so that it can be used on uh, agricultural forever, you know, by by having the land purchased by the council people that they give them a certain amount of money for that. So we're working on that to give them a 
financial boost. So we can stay dairy farming. That is like the, secretly that's what I want. Like Bob <laughs> said that it's been tough years from, from 15. The weather is the biggest thing, and then like the whole milk prices. Yeah. Like four or five years ago, we were getting picked up quite a day with record milk and the milk that come where you can make 13, 14 dollars. Like you know, it's it's impossible. Uh -huh. you can't. That's what I mean in terms of farmers eating control of their market. Stores. Thank you, Thelma. Would you like to tell us about your farm? Wonderful farm. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate being here and hearing from all these other farms. It's, it's just amazing to hear about the diversity that exists out there in the dairy world. And it's really cool to see all the different models and how everybody makes it work for them. Um, so I and my husband, Ricky, run a Foxy Cow Farm. We're up by Random Lakes. We're about a half an hour north of here in Sheboygan County. Um, it's the farm that I grew up on. Um, I'm the third generation on it. My kids who are out here in the library somewhere, they're eight and 10, um, are, are the fourth generation on, on the dairy farm that we're at. But in our area, we, we rent land from the original Heidel Homestead, which I don't even know how long that's been in the family. I think that was in our family for well over 100 years, dairy farming as well. Uh, but my grandpa bought the farm that we're on in the 50s because it was a better farm. It was more modern. In the 50s, it had running water and things like that. And so, um, and it had a uh, uh, sugar bush because he really wanted to make maple syrup. And so we bought, he bought that farm and that's where my dad had been running the farm. And you now my husband and I um, run the farm. And it's, and it's, for us, it's been an, it's been an interesting journey because I came back to the farm in 2015, so which was not that long ago. Um, I had careers in other areas and places and spaces. I'm an entomologist by training, research scientist. Um, but things changed when I had kids. I got married and had kids. And then you start thinking about like, where do you want to go in life? What do you want to do? What's really important? And a couple of things really came to the top of my list. I always had connections to the farm. I've always been in agriculture, um, but thinking about where the food comes from that I feed my children and my family and, and seeing my parents and what they were doing and really, really starting to respect and, and honor what they had done to the family farm. Uh, when I grew up, it was, a, it was a conventional agricultural farm. We always plowed the field. I remember not wanting to touch the pink and the orange or the pink and the green corn because they're, you know, chemicals on them. Um, and, you know, our cows were inside all year and, and that was just, that's the way it was. And then um, over the last 25, 30 years, my dad started to make some changes to the farm and um, switched the whole thing to a grazing operation. And everything went out of row crops and everything went into uh, pastures. And so our entire 80 acre farm now is all pastures and it has been for the last, since at least 2000, none of our um, fields have been worked up at all, um, other than to intercede. And so it's a grazing farm and we graze our animals out across the field. That's our primary feed source. And in fact, now our animals are 100% grass fed. So it's just, it's just a different model. And it's one that we have found works really well for us as a small farm. Uh, we have about 60 cows. 58 cows when I was growing up and now we milk about 65. So we really haven't changed a whole lot. We're not looking to grow because our land base is what supports the number of cows that we have, especially now that we've really gone to grass fed. We know how much we can get per acre off of it to feed the animals. And that's where we're gonna stay. So now it's looking at a model of not growth per se, but how can we make what we have be profitable to be able to still be able to succeed and continue on as a dairy farm? And it's it is it's very different than some of these other um, dairy models that you know others here are talking about. And it's 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 looking at things always a little bit differently. And my husband and I are willing to try some sometimes odd different things to make it work for what works best for us. We really we do it ourselves. Um, he's full time on the farm. I do have an off farm job, and then I do a lot of the farm marketing as well. We are certified organic. Um, we sell our milk to Organic Valley. That's how I know her uh, and 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 having that certified organic status allows us to um, get a premium price on our milk which is also really important to looking at you know what's the profitability of your farm and being able to make money and income off of it uh, and for us we are 100 grass fed and part of that reason is because well 
if my husband was here, he'd have the story of he doesn't like riding on a tractor at all. And he has <laughs> never, he's not from a farm. He grew up in Grafton. He's not from a farm. He didn't know what farming was until he met me. Um, and so he's never planted corn, soybeans, or any of that. And he doesn't want to, and he never will. And so for us, it's all right, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to make work for us because this is the best model for the way we are. And with us having little kids, um, they're getting a little bigger now um, and thinking about, we don't want to hire a lot of outside help because that's all you know, extra expenses and things like that, trying to manage it. Um, we've done some things to try and give ourselves a break because farming, especially dairy is notorious for 24 seven, you don't get a break, right? Um, and we struggled with that a little bit. So we've done some things with the management of our farm, like, well, we just decided to milk our cows once a day <laughs> in the past year and go once a day instead of doing twice a day, simply to give a break to ourselves. And because we're grass fed, because we don't push high production, we push a lot more of like the quality of the milk versus quantity, um, we can do that. It's not something that everybody can do, but it's something that we looked at our system and we looked at our cows and what we could manage. Like, Let's try that. And our joke with that was, well, we're going to try it. We're going to see what happens. The cows keel over and die the next day. Then we know that was a really bad decision. But you know, that was a, that was a year and a half ago, and they're still kicking, and they're fine. Um, we are now, right now, milking twice a day again because we did something else different this year, which was we went full seasonal uh, because we're grass fed. Our farm is really reliant upon when the grass grows. Being Wisconsin, the grass is only growing for like less than half the year, so they're grazing for that period of time. And we decided we're like, well, let's let's have all the cows have their calves at one time, and then we can um, have them have their calves and milk out, and then we'll have them all dry up and go on their two month vacation at the same time, which means we get to go on vacation for two months at the same time. And we did that this summer, and that was another just big game changer, trying to balance family life, farm, business, and everything um, along with it. But when you dry up cows you don't have that you don't have the milk income so we also do a lot of direct market business on our farm as well so even though our milk does go to organic valley and it goes for cheese and it goes to fluid milk just depending on which day which truck needs to go where we also do a lot of direct market beef um, i sell 100 grass-fed beef to local people um, i've helped start local um, farmers markets in the area there's one craft and the reco rings um, just try and create these communities to be able to support direct market food businesses. So, um, oh, not just farms, other local farms. So I just, I, I have a lot going on. I realize that diversity is kind of key, I think, to our, our farm not growing and being successful at the same time that there's there's a lot of different avenues. And every every model for a dairy farm can be a little bit different to make it work for what works best for you or your family. So I'm just going to stop there. So with that, that's very well said because I think each and every one of us has some level of diversity and we have to be able to be flexible and agile enough to know what's going to work for you and your family in order to whatever's going on in your life, right? Yeah. So Part of what's the strength within each of your families of what you like to do? My husband does not like marketing, but I love it. Or like, what are you good at making? Or what do you really like to people like doing the livestock here? Do that. That's kind of sort of fascinating. Now, um, some of the um, questions I I have here have already been um, discussed, but um, some of you do have value-added products. I know you have value-added products that you love my shop. And also download yourself. I know I've I have your lovely egg, eggs. Yeah. yeah. It, it, Resimo gorgeous. Uh, my friend Peggy and I have tested Resimo gorgeous chicken. And, uh, and uh, are you going to show us a picture? I, I do photography and I do a calendar every year, so I just probably want to show things, but like, oh, because then you can see like what the farms do. So <laughs> these are the eggs that she's looking at. They're really, really good. And uh, you know, Lucas has had some eggs too. Are, are, your, are your chickens giving any eggs these days? Um, the first, uh, we only have like five of them. I want to get a few more. Um, okay, that's up for that's up for dad, I guess. But um, the there was one egg last night. That's the first egg I got. 
Yeah. Because the farm is six um yeah in July, so they're just starting to wait now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you have to start handing out your cards. <laughs> another another thing, I think it's a very important question in my mind is where people keep their cats. I mean that some cows are outside of grazing as some of the subscribed and some others are in the barn. Can you just can you just tell us about where your cows spend spend their time? Um <clears throat> Well, um, I would say and why. Which, okay, um, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. In 2013, uh, similar to Shelley, um, we had a barn fire on Christmas morning, 2013. So um, we were in the midst of expanding, um, but we didn't expect to move the barn, the old barn, as I call it. Uh, that had a lot of constraints relative to airflow. Um, and that's when Michael was joining us uh, with the LLC. And we had just built a new uh, pepper facility that was going to be open. Um, so again, better airflow, but that was for the uh, yearlings. Um, and we made a decision at that point to uh, put up a uh, heated shop. And then off of that was a calf facility. Um, again, open size, better airflow, better health uh, for the, the calves um, as they grow. Um, and then we expanded from uh, 50 cows to 85 and we pumped out the one end of the barn um, and put um, multiple fans. So we got like four fans on the east side so there's and then we opened up uh, the uh, milking barn that was actually built in 1981 uh, we pulled off some of the sides so that it's got like garage doors that you can open up and so again better air circulation better airflow um, and it's much healthier for the for the animals uh, so that took place from like 2013, uh, I think we're finished uh, 2016 and all of the different uh, remodeling and building that we need to do. So, and, 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 but I have seen your cows outside. I mean, oh, I, yes. I knew I was at a dairy farm because yes. it's an active dairy farm when I drove by and said, oh, there's a cow. Yes, we do have that because it's some drawing. Yep, we do have uh, the cows on pasture. So, in the summertime, they only really come in uh, to get milked, and then we feed them TMR for a little mixed ration. Um, they get that, and then they're back outside. In the winter, though, um, on very bitter cold days, like days like today, where it's sunny, beautiful, uh, they'll be outside. Um, okay. And the only time that they are really in the barn is when it's uh, very bitter cold, icy, uh, okay. nasty outside. Um, but we do like to try to let them out uh, to get air uh, in, in the yard. Um, mm -hmm. But then we want to be careful because we don't want them to slip or fall either sure. on concrete. So, um, but yeah, that's that's how we handle it. Yes, yes, yes. That's interesting. So, and, and and what is their feed that normally they get? Um, and do you grow your own feed? Or you uh, yes, we do uh, grow our own feed. Uh, like I said, we're kind of the southern end of the county. I grew up kind of in the middle of the county. Right. And um, we do uh, have land uh, yes, there. Quite and so we do wind up having to take uh, the equipment up and, and we do make our own feed. Very good. Yes. And uh, Shelly, did you like to describe your cows? Yes. Yeah. 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 Sure. So there you go. Our 200 cows are housed in a crystal barn, um, which is a large barn. It's more of a conventional barn that you'll see nowadays. Um, it's divided into four pens, uh, four large pens, and the cows are able to roam around, but then they have sand bedded stalls that they can go lay down for when my kids go play. <laughs> 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 okay. I always say, well, I mean, it's going to be clean because that's where my kids are too. Yeah, I mean, in the turf, yeah, but 
Um, we 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 don't have pasture access for our cows. We've tried pasturing in various different ways throughout the years, and it just doesn't fit for our farm. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we had a barn fire in 2013, and that's the barn that we lost was where our young cattle were um, in the old barn, which is the original dairy barn that was standing on our homestead. Mm -hmm. um, and so we did those um, two two sheds for our heifers and our calves. The calf barn we designed for ourselves specifically so that it would, uh, both sides of it would be completely open. So in summer, it would just right through the calf barn and the calves can kind of see everything. Um, and we're able to, to our calves, when we, when they start big, so they're housed in individual little pens. Mm -hmm. um, and then as they get older, we have the capability to remove some of those panels and we put them into small groups. Uh, to be grouped together to get closer to each other. So um, nothing, nothing real fancy, very conventional type housing is what we have for our animals. And we found it works really well. You, you know, you take you take care of the cows and they take care of you. It's, it's quite similar. And what about their feed? Yeah, so um, we grow as much, all of the land that we have is used to feed our cows. Um, and then we're also able to buy some as well because we don't have quite enough to, to feed all of our animals. Um, and uh, we also feed a TMR, which like I said, it's a total mixed ration. Um, so it's a mix. We have corn silage, haylage, um, and we also have done, over the years we've done, there's been some really creative ways that we have tried to not only stretch our budget, but also uh, keep things out of landfill. So there is, we have fed our cows, um, grocery store refusal, I guess is kind of what we would call it, uh, that there are companies that will go and pick up food that is not good for human consumption or has one bad cut or you know, doesn't meet standards for human consumption. And then we get that in semi-loads and are able to feed that to our cows and mix it in, um, which was it's really, really interesting. Uh, we the kids love our cows and then go name them all and things like that. Um, and it can be anywhere from breads or fruits, vegetables, um, you name it. It goes into like a big, a huge, we call it a TMR mixer and gets mixed up. Um, but it's really interesting, the big pieces that we make would feed the cows. It's really fascinating to watch them like, which one will eat first? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it could be apples and a sweet potato. Like, I don't want broccoli today. You know, like, it could be anything. And it's, it's kind of neat. You don't think about the different ways that dairy farming fits into society. You know, like what happens to all of the food waste that we as humans don't use? And there's a lot in agriculture, not just dairy farming, but there's a lot of facets of agriculture that are kind of behind the scenes that really fill in some of these gaps. And they can utilize us so much better. Cows have an entirely different digestive system than humans, and they can use that kind of system. So we've we've done some creative things like that. Um, uh, we have gone back to more of a traditional, uh, mostly using the feed that we have the vegetables. So, but there's a lot of fun, fun things like that. And our kids would like to feed the cows. <laughs> I can tell you more stories. <laughs> um, sure. We would love to hear them. Okay, so we have a year, a thousand year, in your company of our grass beds. They are on pasture. Yeah, our farmers really create a hard uh, uh, environment for them to live like cows. And so I can let Selma talk about that. But um, yeah, it, it's they are on pasture. Not all of our cows are grass milk exclusively. Mm -hmm. um, so they do get, you know, the uh, different feeds. We have a feed pool that our uh, some of our farmers uh, take part of um, and get product to their cows and other people. It's, it's very cooperate, a lot of cooperation at the cooperative. Mm -hmm. So, which is awesome. Um, but it, yeah, they 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 love to do cow things, which is it's pretty cool. Now, how many uh, how many uh, farms are in in Wisconsin? Are in in Wisconsin? Yes. Ooh, good question. I should have looked that up. <laughs> <laughs> but we have nearly 1,800 dairy our, our farms across the United States. So we're from everywhere from the Pacific Northwest to the 
um, northeast, which is actually where I was in August. So it's it's really cool. We have friends up north. Don't quote me. Oh. Wisconsin. I'll have to get back to all of you. <laughs> I I have read I've been stuck in my brain with Wilson Dairy Farm in the last couple months, and um, I've read that organic milk is just top notch in terms of it's kind of something that Vermont quality can't be equal. So um, that doesn't mean that other farms don't sugar cane also. But in terms of a cooperative, we're talking about as a unit, organic cooperative. As a member, organic cooperative. Yes, as I should say, as an organic cooperative. There are other organic dairy farms, but they don't have the standard. So we have stable pay price, which I, I can't even imagine, but um, everybody else on the panel besides Thelma has right. went through the past, you know, kind of five, 10 years. Um, so our stable, our pay price is set for the entire year, which is, it, it's it's pretty fantastic because I, like I said, I can't imagine. My grandfather worked off the farm because he couldn't afford to eat the meat. So, yeah, so that's that's an issue that I brought up in the beginning with controlling your market. You can be competitive to, what was that, $14, 700 grams per pound or whatever that was, under 100 weight. Hundred weight was impossible. You just cannot survive on that. So that's a big concern. And what do you feed your cows? <laughs> <laughs> Why did I ask? Yeah. <laughs> Similar to these other two, <laughs> TMR. Okay. Uh, why did it feed? Also, she brings up waste product. I don't know how many years ago I happened to have a brother who's a dairy nutritionist. That's all he does is balance rations for dairy cows. And uh, he ran into a waste product from, the cedar, uh, from a cheese factory that they were land spreading or going to filtration plants that was actually high in sugar or energy, and energy produced milk. And we've actually been uh, feeding that probably for 10 or 12 years now. In fact, we just happened to start feeding a product, similar product, from Shriver Dairy out here, just a few miles down the road, that they were uh, they were occasionally being able to process another product. Whenever they couldn't, they had to dump it in the filtration plant or land spread it. And we just, as of March, started picking that up that we happen to be able to feed with the mutilites and you know, all of it. The housing situation, nothing wrong with anybody's housing. I think farmers try to do the best they can to preserve the land and take care of the land. That's their livelihood. But when you get a large facility like we happen to be, we're controlled more by the government. We can't even allow our cows to be, we can allow our cows to be out on grass or out on land. But as soon as there's uh, ground or it isn't covered with grass, you know, that's not allowed. So I have a total confinement operation. Our cows, I don't want to say never see daylight, but rarely see daylight. Our new facility, uh, cross vent barns. Hers would be a tunnel ventilated barn. Ours have to be cross ventilated barn. The reason ours is cross ventilated because as these farms or these barns got larger and larger and larger, they couldn't put enough fans on the end of a barn to pull the air through. So we pull the air across the barn. Um, we had people, we give tours, my daughter gives tours our place. We have people come to our facility in the summer. We actually have a seven mile per hour wind going through that year round, but it's temperature controlled. And people will think that they're actually in some air conditioning with a little cooler or something. A cow will respond in production by her comfort. And that's why a lot of these modern facilities, they're getting production out of their cows at the are because the cow is uncomfortable. I tell people, and maybe these others do that too, but there's the newer freestyle barn we have, I think 550 cows in that particular barn. We don't even use it for fly, fly control because flies don't like the breeze. So we constantly have a breeze going through that. We don't have you know any issue you know with flies. Um, one of the more recent regulations that I don't like is because the consumer doesn't want us docking our cow tails. 
I'm just going to ask. And if, you and, if, and if we want to be able to sell our product, our milk, we're not allowed to dock our tails anymore. I don't know how many of those people maybe dock their dogs' nails or tails or whatever. And the type of facility we have, docking a tail, take part of the tail off. Our, our facility, the cow lays in the stall, similar to what was explained up here. You have your long tail with your switch, and behind it is their manure and that stuff, and they'll you know switch or move their tail and get their backs all dirty. If you're in milking them, and if it happened to be laying the nice sloppy manure, you get that in your face occasionally, you know. <laughs> so one of the things I don't like is in order for us to ship our milk now, we can't dock our tails anymore, which which has created especially our heifers, much dirtier animals. It's one of those things that consumer don't understand that we're trying to do to make a good, wholesome product. And they're dictating what we can and can't do. The same with how we're regulated for uh, not allowing the animals out on ground or grazing, because if there's any ground show that could possibly erode, that's a no-no. So ours are totally confined. And, and heavily regulated, not that I like it, heavily regulated, you know, by the DNR. So even the way, and not that others are not doing a proper thing with their manure, their disposal, but we have to monitor where everything goes that's gotta be reported and how much is on each acre of land. Obviously with the technology we have today, it's made it a lot easier. We, we have our manure applied by a commercial applicator and he has actually color coded maps on how much went where and the sensitive areas in the field close to water or something like that, they can't uh, apply as much to help limit some of the pollution. Everything gets incorporated. So there's, there's a lot of things that we're regulated that we have to do trying to keep the environment safe. Yeah, that was a question I'm gonna ask at time Anyway, um, I will I guess that will um, Jeffrey about his first about his feeding his cats. And where you keep your cats. Okay, cool. You know what a PMR so I would need mix it up. Mainly baleage, some dry hay, 60% corn silage, corn, you know, byproducts from full up. And my cows, I have 74 still up farm. We got nice thick mats and all of them, but all of like the last year and a half. I'm short of labor. I got four different pastures for the summer, usually till November. I just keep them. I don't even control them anymore. They want to go this one, this one, or that one. They kind of know where to go, where the grass is. And nights they go to different ones, depends on where the wind is. And starting like probably two years ago, winter, I don't keep them in the barn anymore. The barn is 225 feet long. And we have concrete that's about 300 feet long, 350. So I've been bedding them on the east side of the barn on the concrete and make them a nerve pack. And I don't know, their legs are healthier than ever. My other health is unbelievable. I haven't dry treated now for three years. I treated one cow for mastitis in the last three years. And it's just got other health. It's just, I don't know, when the winter, if they're in the barn and then you let them out to eat and exercise with that changing in temperature all the time, but since then, it's just unbelievable that they keep them out like that. But I had, a, I had a big manure pack in spring. I had a hard hole so because I don't, I just keep adding. If we get a little bit of snow, then I put four or five big bills of straw down at once, and they're nice and clean. Whatever they want, that's big. Um, and you know, keep the cows out. I don't have to bed them in the barn. I don't have to feed them in the barn. Yeah, and that's what I'm very happy. They love it. I started betting this year when we had those three inches of rain around for the beginning of November. And they started betting. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah, well, with where our animals are, it kind of depends on the season. Since we are we're so seasonally based with being a dairy farm. In the, the summertime, I just, I'll just throw some of these pictures up here. These are the ones I have. Uh, June of 2021, but like 
our cows are out on pasture and we don't we don't just put them out on pasture we are grazing them so like a hundred percent of their feed comes from the pastures as well so we do um we call it adaptive managed grazing so once twice sometimes three times a day we're moving them to give them their new feed so we don't do tmr or anything like that especially in the summertime it's we have our pastures that are planted to a really specific very diverse mix of grasses that provides a lot of what they need. We do also give them free choice mineral and things like that as well, because that doesn't come from the pastures. But from this alone, we we got and we get our, we can test the quality of like our pastures, the hay that comes off of it to see if we're getting what we need from it for a dairy animal. And and it is it's very high quality. So um, that's where it comes from in the summertime. They're great, so they're getting their exercise and moving around and everything like that too. Um, and then in the winter time, like now we we make hay uh, off of our pastures. So some of our pastures get the first cutting and early spring gets taken off for hay or baleage. Um, a lot of it gets wrapped up for baleage um, and then all of it's quality tested. So we know exactly which field and what quality this is, the higher quality tier, the lower quality tier, we'll mix that up in the winter time. So we know exactly what we're feeding them at all times. Um, and we feed it mostly as, um, a process bale, we have a, a loader for our bales spread out, and then they have a, a feed, uh, feed pads that we feed off of that. Um, and all of our feed comes from our farm. Uh, we do, we don't have enough acreage on our farm, but on uh, my, my dad's farm, we run land there and then we take most of it off there. And if for some reason we think we're going to be a little bit short, we might buy from some other local organic mm -hmm. farms. But for the most part, we are really self sustaining. Um, with what we can do, which is one of the other advantages that we've found with grazing and pasture-based is we don't have those fluxes with like five inches of rain doesn't really affect us because the grasses are still growing. Um, we don't have to wait, you know, we don't have to wait for like an extra month because we got five inches of rain before we can get into like plant our crops or anything like that. So that's just kind of one of the things for us that we found because we don't have to worry as much about that. All the your weather climate change thing. Um, and then, yeah, that's the pasture and kind of the, the housing. That yeah. It's, they have that in the wintertime, they're inside in our barns. It's an old barn built in the 1850s that we've kind of retrofitted. We've got three, three, um, three stalls in there for them. We've opened it up. We put a parlor in uh, about five years ago now. So we have a, a parlor that we can use and then three stalls. So that's where the cows are in the wintertime. They always have access to outdoors, not necessarily pasture, because with the ice and wind and, and snow and stuff, it can get really dangerous to have the cows traveling too far, but they always have access to at least like a southern exposure, and that's where they, they eat in the wintertime. Oh, one uh, <clears throat> important, I'd like to open up to the audience too, but before I do that, um, I do want to, uh, Bob was referring to about being um, that the farms are saturated in order to survive. And that too um, is a question that I think we ask our panel about whether smaller farms can survive. And I certainly think that you can have a variety of sized farms. Um, as we can see by our panel, there's so many um, several people here that have a small. And I hope that we can cope with. And uh, but I'd just like to open it up to anybody in the panel that'd like to address that issue about getting um, whether we have sites getting bigger. I don't want to be critical of any size spot. It's what you chose. I chose the direction I went. I think that's something I was one of the two, and that's the direction I went. I, I believe it's tough. To make a living today on a small farm, I might be wrong. I believe it's, it's, it's tough to do that. And a lot of things that drives uh, me growing my indebtedness. Trust me, I owe a lot of money. Uh, uh, building this new facility, we had to add cows. One of our neighbors says, well, I hope you don't milk any more cows. <clears throat> if I wouldn't add cows to the facility, but the money I just spent. I wouldn't make it. So a lot of a lot of this up is driven by indebtedness, and uh, uh, 
smaller farms, if they're debt free, they're going to last a long time if they can survive. Chime in there to the expansion has been something that has been over the years um, a couple different times. And then actually, our farm right now will hold about 200 for various reasons, some are out of our control, some not. And um, I personally do not want to see any more cows out um, simply because I know the resources that we have, and I know the strengths and weaknesses strengths and weaknesses that my husband and I have when it comes to management, employees, uh, field work, and things like that. And then also the realization of taking, talk about taking control. Uh, that is one of the biggest reasons that I chose to go a different avenue when it comes to diversity and finding another avenue of income. And for me, that's going to farmers markets. Uh, it's also a big passion of mine to be able to connect directly with consumers. Um, because I feel that's important that you fully know who your farmer are, farmer is, and to be able to trust your resources. Um, so, I I don't have a problem with expansion. We've done that. We started with 50,000 years ago, um, but I'm having way more fun expanding my product line. Uh, the last time that the milk price really jumped, we talked about a couple of years ago, is when I got really upset and pricey, and that's where my llama sold me from because I was determined to make money on our milk one way or another way to do that for us is to take a little bit more control of that process. Connecting consumers and those control So I don't want to I don't want to expand uh, but I will expand my product as well. Next direction. Obviously, it's been an issue for the last time we spoke for time. But I just kind of just to hope that farms can manage in, 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 a, in, a, in a way that's not necessarily discriminatory. Well, we may have to say, and I think what has been said here is spot on. It's about personal choice, it is whether it's your family situation uh, for, for us and, and, and then uh, the environment around us and being able to diversify, right? So what, what Bob and Shelley both said is spot on because at the end of the day, it's where is your location, right? We're pretty much landlocked in the city of Kentucky. Right? Um, and, and what do you want to do for your family? What do you want to do for yourself? It is about you know, financial investment, do you want to take that risk, right? Or do you say, okay, what are your circumstances? And then make that decision from there. And for, for me and my family, I wound up working outside of, you know, the farm. Right. Um, you know, I come home and I help. And my husband's like, why are you so energetic? And it's like, because it's not stressful, like <laughs> being in an office, right? So again, it's everybody's experiences because I spent 40 years in corporate America. And for me to come home and drive the tractor or, or help uh, with, the, with the, the farm chores, that was like a stress relief. That was your therapy. That was, yes. <laughs> that was my therapy. Um, so I think it's everybody's situation and circumstances and their environment and the decisions and choices that they make personal. So I just want to chime in. Yes. The reason Organic Value was founded was to save the small family farm in the 80s. Um, and so that's why we're here. So I will kind of do the fight for the small family farm for Velma and my farmers because um, I don't know if you, anybody knows. Um, we, 40% of our farm membership is plain community, which means they are Amish Mennonite. Um, and, and so they have small farms. And uh, it's, it's we're, we're making a future for the small family farms that we hope to continue to sell um, because it is crucial. I mean, Bob, it's awesome that, that you have, that you adapted and you figured out how to make it work here. But the, our farmers like to stay small. Yeah, I love the range of farm sizes. 
conversation we have with the students. Uh, <clears throat> go ahead. Oh, we got some questions. Oh, <laughs> There's a couple of this couple of details about a first. My joggers are that. I wrote that down. I got further doing. Yeah, yeah. Just look up uh on the on the website or computer, whatever you can do. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm just about computer literate. Um my daughter's real involved, but she's just completed her ninth year of inviting kids young kids out to the farm to teach them about production A. And then uh, the new facility we built has a viewing room. So anybody that wants to come out there can see us milking at the time of the milking. And uh, she's also started uh, offering sleigh rides now during the winter time or during the holiday season. That's another way of diversifying a little more to be able to uh, keep the family all involved. I'm, I'm really fortunate because the only uh, child of mine that is not involved with the farm almost on a daily basis, even some of the in-laws, happens to be my daughter that lives down in Janesville and it's because of the distance. But all the others are either helping feeding calves or son-in-law is uh, uh, helping with field work and that stuff. In fact, my one son-in-law, Jackie's husband, happens to work for the village of Sockville. And then uh, in a comment here not too long ago, he says, when I said I knew, I didn't realize it was going to be birthday parties, slave rides, <laughs> farm camp, working on a farm. And, and the, he, he's really good and energetic, but he puts more time in on the farm between my daughter and our, myself than he does at his you know, regular job. But yet my daughter went to River Falls and when she came home, she wanted to know to do that and educate the people about it and just you know look up uh road barnyard adventure that happens to be my my daughter that's just you know up the road here about six or seven miles some of our farmers do um airbnb kind of like that what? yeah it's really cool um so yeah we have two there it's very interesting and I'm hoping that more farmers do that and, and, and my daughter's hoping to expand it mm -hmm. um issue right now is there in their childbearing years with kids. She doesn't have a little time for that. And uh, that thing's planned for all the grandchildren. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'd like to ask Mike this morning I looked at the price of butter. <laughs> and uh, I'm wondering if the sub is down there. Is there a shortage There is not. I can say that hands down there is not a shortage of um, so I also sit on a co-op board uh, as a the representative for the farmers in my district. And um, we meet annually board says uh, typically what we're more concerned about is a surplus of money, which means uh, you're aware of some of the things that happened like during COVID. A lot of the farmers, especially in the south and in certain areas, had to dump their milk. Um, but that would be to surplus. So there is absolutely not, and I can I can say confidently there will never be a shortage of milk in the West. The problem is the is the process of getting the milk to you guys, to the store, to yeah, supply chain, transportation, finding milk haulers, people to drive the trucks to get them from the farm to cedar birds. She belongs to the she belongs to the DFA and belong to the DFA as of first of the year this past year they impose quotas on us we can only produce so much milk and if we do, if we produce over our quota that was assigned to us they're going to dock us mm -hmm. and at one time this spring they were docking us 270 per hundred weight mm -hmm. now you got to understand dfa controls about 30 percent or 33 percent of the milk in the country and they actually actually have in our immediate area four different regions and depending on where the region you is you will be docked more there's a deficit in the southeastern part of the united states so the region that's close to the southeastern part of the united states if you're producing over your quota sometimes you won't get digged or docked but that's what's happened and, and, it, and it's happened because 
there's never going to be a shortage of milk. We we can now produce more. We can produce more milk for producing, but then the price drops. amazing what we've done with this product. Majority of like what we get paid on is just fluid fluid milk. But that milk is taken and during the process broken down to so many different components that you can use in the same natural cheese, your dry cheese powder, your iced coffees, whether it's the cream, the, the fat is taken off the butter. Uh, there's Yes, and then there's the byproducts of your cheese making and some of these dairy product processes that then is sold for another market or for our animals or for another another fat of agriculture. Yep, sir, there's casein. There's a lot of different ways. So you, you might hear uh, dairy farmers, you know, we got a little upset or excited like during COVID when our milk checks were cut um, almost sometimes up to 50%. Because I will personally say that I don't think I'll ever get paid for the full value of our milk simply because of how versatile it is, how many different ways you can use milk. And that's just food. You realize we're not even talking about soap. <laughs> just but it's that's a really good point. I'm really glad you brought that question because oh, we've seen the difference in other grocery stores with the price of butter going up or cheeses, things like that. Um, and we don't see that price increase isn't generally reflected in the grassroots price that we're going to get paid for. And most of that is absorbed by processing, which yeah. makes complete sense as what we've seen with the price of products, transportation, gas, things like that. It affects every every step of the food chain. Um, and unfortunately, we're in the grassroots end. And a lot of times it doesn't, it's not enough left for the pie, but it gets down to us. But I, I might not answer your question. <laughs> and, and you got to understand when you drink fluid milk, how many, how many drink whole milk? Two percent yeah. skim. The fat's been extracted off of that and used for some of these byproducts. So when you're buying that skim milk or 1% or 2%, Something's been extracted off of that already. You, you aren't drinking the whole food of milk. Yes. I I will say this because you brought up that food obviously is very food is my thing. But when you talk about saving the family farms or just supporting farmers in general, small small farms, yes. Um, whatever your food choices are, um, organic, grass fed. Conventional, whatever you choose in the dairy in, in the grocery store, 
I do encourage you to go out and meet farmers, go to a farmer's market, find somebody that does have a value added product. Or if you'd like to go meet a dairy farm in this area, you know, talk with one of us or we're not by Watertown, like I'll help you connect with a farmer. Go and meet a farmer and just see these animals that are producing this milk. And better yet, um, you know, support the farms and small farms with your money. What are you buying? I, I do challenge you, go to the dairy case, go to your grocery store and try a new product because there are so many out there. When we do school tours on our farm, I did like a milk tasting thing once. Um, I did a yogurt bar where kids could put different toppings on there. And that is the best way. Like each one of you has the power to help a small farm or an organic farm, whoever. And that's kind of the coolest way. And you treat yourself. I just want you to know that I didn't find other ones much that I could. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, follow the farms on social media to follow Organic Valley. I see some great posts that you can do. Um, ask questions. Buy from your local CSA. Uh, buy from farmer owned organizations because they're back home in the community. And they're amazing. I, that's why I love my job so much because I love farming. And they're essential. I just, want to, I just want to make that point too that it's food we are producing. It might be a commodity, but we need food every single day. And it's it's very important. Um, I know we're over time, but our co op just uh, asked my husband and I to go to Washington, D.C. to speak with some of the senators about some of the bills that they are working on that are directly affecting agriculture when it comes to workforce. Um, access and things like that. And that was a key point. Like this this isn't this isn't just for fun. Food is essential to this country and it does take all of our voices to work together, no matter what our differences are, but we can have a lot of fun with this too. So and wow. and in the United States people pay the take the least out of their paycheck to provide food. Than any other country in the world. Cheap food is sort of the order of the future. The way things are going, for the better, to help them get run. And unfortunately, it doesn't help tech, our farmers. I think the biggest thing your your butter, your ice cream, your meat, beef, and all that stuff. The biggest reasons they have increased so dramatically because of the issue with labor. I, I take all my animals to a, a, a market and sell, and I talk to the processors there, and there's only a handful of processors left, you know, in the state here. And they, the increase in wages they've had to do just to keep help is, is out of this world. And that's being passed on to the consumer. The same with transportation, all that stuff. Getting it from us to you is the biggest reason it's costing so much. Well, those are really important points. Is that Andrew? We do have to, we do have to stop now. But <laughs> uh, I'd love to go on and on. This is just a fantastic discussion. I had, I had about ten more questions. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, it, maybe some of you can take up your some of your questions after completed here, and then there are all sorts of materials on the back table. That you can partake in, you can take home all different things um, to go over the multitude of related topics as well as say um, dairy engineers or um, each event. And I want to thank our farmers and our representative from Organic Valley so much. <laughs>